Today is Monday, December the 5th. We will be starting the auctioneer commission meeting. Uh, Ron Collier? Here. Bobby Colson? Here. Jeff Morris? Here. Howard Phillips? Here. Adam Lewis? Here. All here. Thank you. We have a notice of the meeting. Yes, the notice was posted on the website on uh, December the 1st. We have a motion to adopt the uh, minutes. Can we adopt the agenda? I move we adopt the agenda second. It's been moved by Mr. Colson and second by Mr. Morris. All in favor, aye. 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 Now the minutes. Do I hear a motion to approve the minutes? Second. Motion's been made to approve the, approve the minutes. All in favor, aye. 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 Director's report. Got a report. Can we jump out of order really quick, Howard? But <coughs> the judge wants to wait about 20 minutes. Okay. We have uh, Frankie Anderson here. He's with the legislative liaison team. Like to hear from so him. any questions that you all have for him on the rulemaking um, right now we have our next rulemaking I think we're set to go on the 15th for the auctioneer um, we'd like to welcome him so any questions Frankie good morning Morning. Um, like she said, I'm Frankie Anderson. I'm the director of legislation for the department. So happy to answer any questions you have about the rulemaking hearing. Okay, can we talk about the uh, online auction rule that was before the legislature now to get sure. a definition of that? A definition of the rule? Of the online auctions. Of the online auctions. Um, so my understanding is, and I have to look at the rules that I have here before me, um, the rule specifically, it defines what a time listing does not include in the rules. Um, essentially, uh, if time is extended beyond the stated ending time, then the auction and the person conducting the auction are no longer included in the licensing, the licensing exemption found in TCA 6219-103. Are you aware that they're trying to change that rule? Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you know where that stands? Uh, so last month, this was before the Joint Government Operations Committee and the legislature, um, and there was some confusion, I believe, about what the rule does, um, and the uh, decision made by the committee was to stay the rule. And so what happens when a rule is stayed, then the effective date is postponed for up to 60 days, allowing time to have another rulemaking hearing. Uh, and so that's where we're at in the process right now. That's what we're waiting until uh, the 15th, until that rule uh, is back before the committee. I'm looking at that. It was actually, yeah, I believe it's actually. The 15th, they weren't sure. Okay, so there's two dates for rule review um, they're anticipating, but this rule, I believe, we expect it to be heard on the 14th on Wednesday. Yes, okay, did, does that rule not take effect December the 5th? December the 5th? Um, we got the effective date moved online to the 16th. It had an 11 day stay posted on it on the Secretary of State's website. I checked it this morning. Okay, wh <coughs> where do we stand? What's what needs to take place to get it to stay as is? To stay as is, the rule would, um, the Joint Government Operations Committee, they would either need to approve the rule uh, as it is, um, or they could they could choose not to make uh, a recommendation on the rule and the rule would still go into effect. The rule would still go into effect, however, it wouldn't end up in the omnibus bill Therefore, at June 31st, it would or June 30th, it would expire. It wouldn't go into effect. It's if they reject the rule. Correct? If they reject the rule, well, there's there's three things that could possibly happen. They could either accept it, reject it, or do nothing. Okay, and if they 
accept it, it's good. If they reject it, it's good till June thirtieth. And then if they do nothing, it's still it would still go into effect. And they don't it or anything. That's correct. Unless there was unless there was no unless there was a decision by the legislature not to uh, include it in the omnibus bill. But I'm, I'm sure that you're familiar with this that was passed in 2006. The eBay rule is how this got started on for online auctions for eBay and what it was you could open you up a store and take consignments to sell online for eBay and since that was what the original rule was for okay and then people doing tag sales and the state sales and the online got popular so they started selling online at, at your house or whoever's house and with with no uh, rules or regulations then now we've strayed away from the original eBay rule and I, the Attorney General this was his opinion because Mr. Colson I think asked for it but I don't understand how that we could let this continue and let people do online auctions and not stay under this rule. This rule is very lenient for them. And as easy as it is to get an auctioneer license and be have a bond and some insurance for people that uh, that you're doing business for. Uh, it's it's a um, trying to think what the word is it, it's scary if if your mom and dad has big estate and they let somebody come in that's not licensed and don't care they could lose a lot of money and they ask a question over there at the legislators the other day how many <coughs> complaints was there well there's not many complaints here on online auctions because the auctioneers that have license don't get complaints there's a few that others but if you check the website the complaints that the FBI has on online auctions will blow your mind. So I think we need to work hard to keep this at least as is. Um, I want to point out um, while I have a, a second that you know really there's there's two options here. It's either going to go into effect or or it's not. Um, but if the there, there's no way for the government operations committee to simply omit one line from this rule. So basically the entire set of rules would have to be rejected by the committee if that were in fact the case that they wished to go that route. Um, so that's something just worth mentioning. Actually, uh, Frankie, I just, before I came down here, was talking with the uh, Deputy General Counsel. There may be a way portion of the rule package that would allow the, I'm sorry, we had conversation with you before, but we may be able to, if, if they reject the online auction portion, the other parts of the rule may effectively be able to go forward. So yeah. we will find that out. Well, there's, there's other portions of this rule, the military applicant portion, and our original thought was that if they rejected any part of the rule, they rejected the, all of the rule. However, this morning we we think we have found a way that that's not true, that that the portion not related to any, por any other part that they reject could still go forward, meaning we wouldn't have to kill think. the whole package. We think. We think. Yeah. be ashamed to kill this uh, you know and there's real estate and and that's what I don't think they understand too completely is it's not just personal property or cut that's bad enough but I mean there's real estate there's cars there's everything being sold like this by unlicensed people that are taking This company or 
company out there, a company out of North Dakota. Are you familiar with them that's pushing this? I'm unfamiliar uh, to the extent I that I've met with uh, uh, the, the individuals here at the department who, who've informed me of, of how they're um, involved in, in this. So I'm not, I'm not very well versed in, in their company and what they, what they do. My point was it's, it's not just people around in Tennessee that's, that's trying to get it. Uh, it's not in the Tennessee. <laughs> yeah. I mean, can we say a text you quick right here? Uh, up around 400,000. Do you all have any other questions for Mark or Frankie? Work hard and help us, okay? They are, and we're going to work hard too. I got, I got confidence in you. Oh, I know thank you, you are. <laughs> thank you all very much. You can come back to that at the end of the meeting too if you all want to discuss further. Would you like us to uh, move ahead to the uh, case since we've got the administrative law judge here or uh, finish up? The director's report is very simple. It's one page. It's short and sweet. Um, the class for review for the education is, is lengthy. It's just one course, though, so we can however you prefer. Well, our, the judge is not ready yet, is he? Then we can we can continue. We'll go, we'll go ahead till he gets. He wanted about twenty minutes. Okay, sounds great. Sounds great. So on your iPads on page one forty three is the new version of the director's report. I think at the last uh, meeting and my schedule had clashed with another board meeting, so I apologize. Um, you will now have my undivided attention on all of your board meetings. Uh, we've posted the twenty seventeen dates so that they don't clash with anything else going on. Uh, this is the new look for the um, financial information that we will be given and I'm skipping to 143 because that class is fair, relatively long and we'll go back to it then in a minute. Um, what the finance team is doing is separating our revenues, our expenses and the good thing with this proposed format is that the cost backs on a monthly basis are going to be added here to the best that, that they can give us as opposed to one large number at the end of the year that um, sometimes can affect the overall total that the that our commissioner board has. So uh, for the four months so far in this fiscal year, July, August, September, and October, the revenues are at the 77905 and then the expenses below are at 44000 leaving us in good shape so far, not only for this year, but then at the bottom. Um, they've got some historical trends that as this new method is used, I think we'll start meaning something, we'll be able to compare March to March and April to April from previous years and look forward. So I think this will. Is that it? That is it. Uh, we can then go backwards if you like. Pages 16 through 40, 142 are the entire uh, educational request for approval. It's one class. I'll give you all plenty of time to review and, and uh, Cody sent this out via email as well. Starts on 16 all the way to 142. We need to read all this, or can you explain it? Um, Cody may be better off explaining it than I am. Uh, it, it's. <coughs> Just pay attention to the uh, the beginning, and then at a certain point, they just attach all the course materials. So if you were to read through it, you would essentially. Have their summary, and just the beginning, as Cody says, should give you.
my only concern about a lot of these courses that we get get submitted, these are people that are in the course business. They're not professionals in education at all. Um, this guy's experience. This guy's experiences. He's at Raytheon. He's at Boeing. He's at T Fashion. He was, you know, he's done websites, uh, and they take our law and they basically regurgitate that back to us as a as a course. You know, make them read the law. And then they're going into some marketing and that sort of thing. But I don't know that any of them have ever been involved in the auction business or ever been involved in auction schools themselves. Um, I don't know that they know, you know like I said, they're professional course people uh, and they write all this stuff and we have no way of, without taking the course ourselves, whether or not they have any knowledge about our industry. Uh, and I don't know how do, we, how do we suss that out or sort that out. Uh, that's, you know, without either interviewing the guy or talking to the guy or, you know, you're reading 143 pages of, of course material isn't really what I'm interested in learning. I'm learn interested in learning what the background is of the guy and from, from where is he coming to, to educate in an online course uh, people that uh, are being licensed in our state. Now, we know a lot of the people that do the courses that we've approved and we know their background. We know that they're highly involved in the uh, National Auctioneers Association. They're part of the National NAA education training. Uh, that they have a passion for our industry, and I just don't. I mean, I, I want to be fair to the guy, but I I don't know how to I don't know how do we go about finding out more about what this material and what this course is all about without having to take it ourselves. I make a suggestion if we could send him an email and let him s the the company send us a resume of their company, short and sweet would be better than this for me. How many online schools do we need? I mean, there's always, that's a fantastic thing to offer for those that can't make it. Um, but I understand exactly with what you're saying. It's unless you're taking it yourself, it's hard. Or we ask that they come in person and explain and answer um, the commission's questions so that when we approve one, it isn't just because they asked to be approved. Right. If you're comfortable with it, I couldn't agree more. We can send a letter, and we would need a motion um, either way because, again, they have, you know, the, the right. right to propose their material. Right. We can send a letter requesting that they appear in person uh, with the concern that the letter or the course seems to be very extensive, but does it really cover what our auctioneers need to take? Uh, and, and whether they cover it or not, is hi and it, it's it's what are they teaching, and and from where are they teaching from? That, that's what I'm trying to understand. I guess I would make the motion that we uh, not approve this application for an online course, subject to us getting some greater detail from the uh, applicant as to his background, his training, and uh, uh, either in email or in person or ever, however he wants to do it uh, in terms of making us comfortable with, uh, with the course that he's offering and from, and from where are they uh, getting their material and, you know, and what, uh, what are they t teaching them. I don't know how to make it more clear than that. Right, and, and so the way I have the motion, uh, Mr. Morris, if you will, is that we will be sending a letter to um, Ms. Amy Lee, who appears to be <coughs> representing um, AT Better CE LLC, and state that at this moment the board is not approving the class subject to them presenting a greater detail of the background, the training, uh, via in person or by letter that specifically explains where the material is coming from and how it relates to the industry. Does that sound good? I don't know how to say it any better. You got a motion? You have a second? Second. All in favor, aye. 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 Hey, I guess we'll get the judge and continue with that. He may not be ready when you come back in here. Hey, you move on.
He'll turn it over to you for as long as you want. You go past lunch, you buy. Go ahead and begin. Today is December 5th, 2016. This is a hearing conducted by the Tennessee Auctioneer Commission. Boncio DBA Tri City Sales and Auctions. rulings regarding the order proceedings, admissibility of evidence, and questions of law under the authority granted me by the Tennessee. I will not participate in the findings of fact or the ultimate decision of the commission. Those decisions were made by the commission members who at this time I'll ask to introduce themselves for the record. Lewis. Bobby Colson. <coughs> Howard Phillips. Ronnie Collier. Page is representing the state in this matter. Uh, the hearing was to begin at 9 o'clock. It is approximately 9.25, and uh, Mr. Faggio is not present, nor has anyone appeared on his behalf. Commission are reminded that during the time this hearing is conducted, no discussion concerning this case between commission members and witnesses attorneys and other members of the commission or persons should take place outside of the hearing unless all parties are present. The commission during the hearing sits as a jury and must only consider Sunshine Law requires all commission discussions and deliberations to made in, in public before all parties. Failure to comply could result in the commission's action being reversed or remanded if a Page, do you have copies of the uh, notice to present to the commission? The commission, if you just take a moment and review uh, the notice of hearing and charges, make sure there's no conflict. <coughs>
commission, I would remind you that the law requires you to disclose on the record any outside knowledge of this case or any communication, written, verbal, or otherwise, from any of the parties concerning this matter. Assessment of maximum civil penalty of up to $200,000. I'm sorry, where, where are you, page three? Page three, number <coughs> one. A actually, yeah, it says 200,000 in parentheses. It has 2,500. Uh, I don't think that's the uh, correct rule anyway. That, that rule uh, provides when it's the commission's administrative director and investigator that's uh, issuing a fine or penalty. And it's actually the, the rule before that, which is 0160-01. Uh, Council will probably address that in, in uh, her closing argument. Uh, Ms. Page, do you have a motion since uh, Mr. Faggio is not present? Yes, Your Honor, I would make a motion for default with Mr. Faggio. Motion, do you have proof of service? Yes, Your Honor, we have a receipt of personal service, which I'm happy to give you for our first exhibit. Additionally, um, I have spoken with Mr. Faggio prior to this hearing two weeks, as well as my paralegal, if you'd like to hear from her, spoke with Mr. Faggio on Friday. I'll bring her the first. <coughs> you don't have to pass that to them. to make this exhibit one yes your honor uh, this was for the original notice of hearing and charges the notice of hearing and charges was amended prior to this receipt however it did not change in substance uh, the amended notice was filed as a con uh, as a result of mr Fagio continuing uh, the previous hearing date so uh, further evidence mr Fagio was aware of this hearing personal service receipt will be marked as exhibit one Personal service receipt shows that uh, Mr. Faggio received notice of the hearing and charges as well. He filed a motion to continue the matter uh, in September. Faggio was aware of the hearing, and I find as a matter of law that notice was sufficient. Uh, at this time, the commission uh, must decide whether or not to bring. Motion for default. Second. Been moved and second. All in favor, aye. Uh, aye. Identify the technical record <coughs> at this time. In a minute, notice of hearing and charges filed on October 6, 2016. Order of continuance was entered on September 7th, 2016. Uh, on behalf of Mr. Faggio on September 20th, 2016. Witnesses and exhibits was filed on September 14th, 2016. Notice exhibit was filed on September 13th, 2016. on July 11th, 2016, and a notice of hearing and charges. Page, would you like to make an opening statement? Your Honor.
call your first witness. Raise your right hand. Do you swear firm that testimony you're about to give in this matter is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr. Buckner, can you introduce yourself to the commission? Uh, yes, I'm Marshall Buckner, uh, investigator with regulatory boards and Department of Commerce and Insurance. How long have you done that? 29 years. <laughs> can you tell us some of the duties you have in that position? Briefly investigate complaints from various boards and commissions of unlicensed activity and uh, also serve licensees or people acting as uh, unlicensed business. I'm to this case with Mr. Fagio? I was, yes. What was the basis of the complaint that you remember? Unlicensed activity at the location in Kingsport, Tennessee. Advertised. There were there were signs out advertising also auction at this location, and the complaint I received was uh, it could have. I don't remember who, but it could have been a former employee or <coughs> a competitor in the in the field. Mr. Beckner, do you remember the address of the auction? Yes, I do. Yeah, what's that? <laughs> 2200 South Wilcox Drive. Um, would you like to see a copy of your report to confirm that address? Yes. Uh, it's uh, Sullivan Gardens Parkway. What, what the address deal is, this building actually sits on the old part uh, that was Highway 93 in Kingsport. And when 93 was widened into a four lane, it was moved over and this we have Sullivan Gardens Parkway, which is the nearest uh, named road actually to this this building. It it, uh, it it sits on what used to be Highway 93 Wilcox Drive. It's just reworking of the highway, and uh, but it is uh, according to 911 records, it, it would be 2200 Sullivan Gardens Parkway. Perfect. Mr. Buckner, did, did you have the pleasure of visiting that site during the investigation? I have. I have been there. How uh, many times? At least four. Can you tell us about the first time you visited the site and what you observed? Uh, the first time I visited, there was a uh, uh, trailer back then unloading various merchandise, and uh, uh, the uh, <coughs> actual the business is part of a uh, four separate, used to be four separate businesses located there that this particular business, there was a lot of seating and there was a counter up for the auctioneer to sit and records keeper and there was a crowd gathering up and uh, merchandise being unloaded. And uh, Photographs of the building while you were there? I have taken photographs of the, of the building uh, at least a couple times. Oh, perfect. I'm going to hand you a document if you can tell us what that document is. Now this is this is the building where the auction was being conducted inside. Uh, it, it occupies actually like two old two sections of the old center that was there. Uh, the in the picture you see a chair sitting in a doorway. That's one of two. Uh, both those doors go into the same area. Interrupt you, Mr. Buckner. Did you you took this photograph? Yes. Is yes. this is this an accurate depiction of what it looked like when you visited that site? Yes. Yes. It's accurate. Your Honor, we would enter this into evidence as Exhibit Two. Two will be marked the uh, two photographs uh, that have been identified at the site that Mr. Buckner visited. <coughs> Mr. Buckner, when you went. Oops. Yes, Your Honor. <coughs> Or did you get a chance to speak with Tim Fagio? Yes, every time I was there, I, I spoke with him. Did he say anything that led you to believe he operated that building? He always met me at the door and took responsibility for the location. He said he was the uh, operator. 
Mm-hmm. Asked me if he had a license. I did. And what did he say? At one point, he told me he did, but he didn't have it with him. And then I found uh, he gave me uh, some information as far as his address. And uh, driver's license number and all that. I took that information down the first time I met with him. At the site, were you able to locate any physical copies of licenses? No, never. What was his demeanor like when you encountered Mr. Caccio? He was defensive about about the operation and the building. He always met me as far away from the building as he could, the door. Okay, Mr. Beckner, have you able? Were you able to observe any advertising online or any other places? I have seen Facebook advertising and uh, and a uh, some site also. I can't remember the name of it, but it, it's advertised quite well. In the area. Mr. Beckner, I'm going to hand you a collective exhibit. If you don't mind looking through it and make sure that you recognize. I have seen a lot of these, yes. And what are these? Advertisements for uh, and dates for an auction at this location, Tri-Cities Auction Sales. What website are those posted on? Tri-Cities Auction and Sales. Uh, are they Facebook advertisements or are they from that auction site? I think they're Facebook. I've looked at both and this looks like it would be a Facebook. What led you to believe these are actually from Tri-Cities? Haven't, do they have any con- information that would tie them to Mr. Casio's business site? Well, the name Tri-Cities Auction and Sales and, uh, and the n- phone numbers down here. Uh, How do you recognize that phone number? I, I've seen that phone number, taken pictures of it, and, and looked at it quite a bit. It's posted on the building. Oh, it's on, it's on the Tri-Cities yes, building? Yes, it was at one time on on the sign for the business. Do any of the advertisements list the address for that site? Auction house, rather. I know, I, I mean, I know where it's, that it's there so well that I just, I don't, I can't say specifically. Any no, I, it's just one of these things when I look at it, I know where it's at automatically. And, uh, Are these posts similar to what you viewed online on the Facebook page? Yes, yes. Uh, but I, I have seen a lot of these. I know we would move this collective exhibit into evidence with the addition of the summary on the front pursuant to Rule 1006 of the Tennessee Rules of Evidence. Three will be marked uh, advertisement uh, for. Mr. Buckner, you said you also saw advertisements from an auction site for Mr. Fagio? Auction site, yeah, I remember seeing the, the same name, Tri-Cities. I'm going to hand Sales. you a couple of exhibits, and you tell me if these are, are what you're talking about. Looks familiar. I have seen this. Yeah. Auction zip anything on these documents that would lead you to believe that they're associated with Tri-Cities Auction and Tim Fagio? Name Tri-City Sales and Auction and the phone number again and and the address 2200 Southern Gardens Parkway. Uh, Are these printouts fair and accurate representations of what would be online? Yes, yes, yes it is. Your Honor, we would move that this next exhibit be entered as a collective exhibit four.
if I dated a report September 5th and uh, it was the date I did the report or the date I went there, I, I would have to see, you know, look at the, uh, yes, it was in my report. Fifth of what year? 2015. Marks the next exhibit. Exhibit four will be marked, collective exhibit four will be marked four pages of uh, advertisements that list uh, Tri-City sales. <coughs> Looking at my report, this one report I did October 2015. Uh, I remember also this other guy was there. He was he was proud. He let me make his picture, but Tim Facio didn't want his picture made. Uh, I do remember that. It was a little funny, and uh, he told me that in regard to that license number that he first used 0177. He used it because it was it was just on the sign that he had posted up there. He didn't have any other already on the sign. Is that one of the license numbers listed in these auction ads? Uh, 0177, yeah, I have seen that in some, uh, initially in some ads, and uh, I think he changed it later on maybe to another number, but. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Buckner, no further questions. The commission have any questions for Mr. Buckner? Yes, I'm Jeff Morris. Uh, when you confront the guy, does he have any explanation as to why he just would not get a license, or did he have any defense of, of, what, of, of the license law and why he would just ignore it? Not really. He just said uh, the first time, actually, <coughs> he told me he had a license, just didn't have it with him. And then as time went on uh, and I went out there and got more acquainted with him, uh, he would just he'd say, well, I'm going to bring a person in. You know, every time was a little, a little different story. And, uh, I, I know he was aware of the law because he would say, "I'm going to bring the person in." We just uh, got started and, and business, you know, going so good. Uh, you know about how long he's been there in that location, operating that auction house. All of 2016, and probably, I know at least six or nine months in 2015. I think he opened it in 2015. That's when I first became aware of it. Okay. It's one of those things you drive you drive by every day, but like I said, the building sits off on what used to be an old old uh, Highway 93, and he does good considering where it's where it's located too, because you know he sits on the old part of the old highway, but draws a good crowd. And uh, well, and mostly just new merchandise or used merchandise, or can you could you tell from what what you saw? A mix, a mix, uh, old. Uh, old uh, merchandise brought in by people that live around there, and I think it's from multiple sellers. Apparently, yeah, yeah, I would, I would say, and he has, you know, like boxes of uh, snacks, probably salvage kind of, you know, complete box of snacks, uh, tool sets. So, in your opinion, this was a consignment auction house. Mentioned one time about uh, percentage. He he let people sell what, what went through. Uh, These were not his own items that he was selling. I don't think he ever identified any of that as being his his property. 
one of these auctions if things here it says welcome to the auction tonight we have and for instance it's got mr mike f in the house to me that reads like that's a seller that he expects people up there to know right right that would that's your consignment part right there it looks like to me live up there you live up that way i live probably six miles from well, i know you sound like you were familiar with yeah. the roads and yeah. all that yeah I'm, I'm still sort of in the old old highway system up there right. things have changed and roads renamed but i know exactly where it's at and this has been going on for approximately two years as an investigator, do you have the authority to, when you know that there is unlicensed activity going on, do you have the authority to call the police and shut the place down? No, I never, never went that route. Uh, Any other questions for this witness? Is he operating now? I mean, still. As far as I know, yes. Does, uh, is, does he do the auctioneering himself? Or? I have never seen anybody actually do okay. auctioneering. They I've gathered and waiting, but if they did it, it was, it was after I left, and I didn't spend a lot of time there, you know. You actually weren't ever at one of the auctions, right? I have stayed there, but it never did start while never I was there. <laughs> 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 right. okay. I, I've seen the big crowd gather. And they were ready. I'm not doubting you. I'm just, yeah. just wondering in my mind. No, I have way. never actually yeah. seen. Okay. Uh, the closest, I could, there was a, another guy that came in there. I can't remember his name. He had a, uh, an auctioneer license. He was there one time <laughs> uh, during my visit, and he was on the uh, uh, person keeping records. And that's the closest I came, to, you know. I'd say as long as you're standing there, we're gonna start a little late today. Now, matter of fact, I think that was that was that was said. <laughs> you know, we're waiting on so and so with another trailer. So, any other questions? Ms. Page, do you have any qu further questions of the witness? Okay, you can step down. You can call your next witness, Ms. Page. It uh, calls Roxanne Vincio. moment oh, sorry about that you need to raise your right hand please do you swear upon the testimony about giving this matter the truth the whole truth nothing but the truth uh, yes Roxana Gamusio I'm the executive director for this commission uh, two and a half months how long have you served as an executive director for the department uh, close to four years all some of the responsibilities that that entails yes I'm the custodian of the records for the licensees that would involve in this particular commission um, the individual auctioneers the firms and galleries any complaints against these on on the profession are you aware of the complaint and the basis of it in this case yes I am can you tell us a little bit about the complaint uh, yes this complaint was received on August 31st of 2015 uh, the complainant stated that uh, an individual that he was associated with in doing auctions and he um, uh, was still holding out himself to do auctions two days a week on Thursdays and Saturdays did not have a proper escrow account and was in essence turning him in for doing unlicensed activity. Did you review Mr. Fagio's uh, file or if go through court to try to identify whether Mr. Fagio had a license? Yes, we did. At that time, uh, the office was just rolling its database system over to what's now called CORE, which is where all the records for complaints and licensees is kept. Uh, looked for Tim Fagio for an individual auctioneer license. Uh, he did not have one. Also, a firm or gallery license uh, at that point, and he did not. Was there a license for any business called Tri-City Sales and Auctions? No, never has been. I'm going to hand you a page of our collective exhibit three from auction zip or I believe four actually and this is the September 3rd date or the September 5th date and at the bottom there is a license number 0177 have you had a chance to investigate where or who that license belongs to yes that license within this profession belongs actually to an individual um, last name Whitmire I believe who's actually deceased and so that would have been an auctioneer and also within the, f the actual firms and galleries 
Uh, it belongs to a firm that uh, is not associated with Tri-City. The name's completely different. The owners have nothing to do with uh, Mr. Facio. That particular license was issued in 1977, is still current today, but doesn't appear to have any association with him. I'm going to also hand you a, a same exhibit, but I'm going to come to you. April 30th, 1998. And there's a different license number on that one, 5918. Have you been able to look into who holds that license? Yes, 5918 actually belongs to an auctioneer. Um, last name is Yoder, and at some point there was a relationship uh, Mr. Fazio and him, uh, but this particular auction's date uh, would not line up to when they were together. So even with these license numbers offered, it still appeared from your investigation that there wasn't a license actually associated with That is correct. What time uh, periods did Tri-Cities Auctions operate without a licensee? Um, it appears that they operated after March of 2016 and continue to to date, and then a period between, I think, September 3rd through October the 1st in 2015 as well. And just to clarify, there was a licensee at some point in October of 2016? Yes, yes that, that was doing the auctions. How long did he stay with that firm, do you recall? Uh, a couple of months. And then there's a long stretch of time between October 2015 through March where there's an association with the licensee, yes. From your experience with this commission, what law requires an auction firm to hold such a permit? 62-19-102 basically says that it is unlawful to conduct an auction without a, an auctioneer, uh, to conduct an auction or advertise of one without having a firm gallery or, or an auctioneer do the auction. And you said it includes advertisement as well? That is correct. No further questions. Questions of the witness? down or remain in your seat. <coughs> Do you have any other witnesses? No, Your Honor, at this time the state rests. All right. Would you like to make a closing argument? Yes, Your Honor. has heard the proof in the matter of Tim Faggio, DBA Tri-City Sales and Auction. It is now my duty to charge you as to the law you must follow in reaching your decision. You are the exclusive judges of the facts in this case. You are also the exclusive judges of the law, specifically your statutes, rules, and regulations and their application to this case. You should apply the law to the facts and decide in this case in the directions of my charge. You exclusively have the authority to make findings of fact and reach conclusions of law in this matter. No one else can participate in
state has alleged that the respondent has violated certain of your statutes and rules. The state's burden of proof to show by preponderance of the evidence that these violations have occurred. Do not confuse this standard with the higher standard of beyond a reasonable doubt. A preponderance of the evidence means the greater weight of the evidence or that there is sufficient proven information to cause you to believe the allegations provide the more probable conclusion based upon all the evidence presented. Your inquiry into violations of rules and statutes to those that were specifically alleged in the state's notice of hearing and charges. And you must base your determination solely on the evidence presented to you during this hearing. Evidence consists of the testimony given by the witnesses during the hearing and the exhibits introduced in the evidence which you may review during your deliberations. Statements and arguments by the attorneys in this case and documents in the technical record such as the notice of charges and the proposed findings and facts and conclusion of law are not evidence. You may use these arguments and documents to assist you in making findings of facts and conclusions of law but you should do so only after careful consideration and determination that they accurately reflect recollection of the evidence and your own conclusions from the evidence. Make your findings of facts based solely on the evidence presented to you at this hearing. There are two kinds of evidence, direct and circumstantial. Direct evidence is direct proof of a fact such as testimony of a witness about what the witness personally observed. Circumstantial evidence is indirect evidence that gives you clues about what happened. Circumstantial evidence is proof of a fact or a group of facts that cause you to conclude that another fact exists. I'd rather a fact has been proven by circumstantial evidence. If you base your decision upon circumstantial evidence, you must be convinced that the conclusion you reach You are to consider both direct and circumstantial evidence. The law permits you to give equal weight to both but it's for you to decide how much weight to give any evidence. Making your decision, you must consider all the evidence in light of recent experience and common sense. You are the sole and exclusive judges of the credibility or believability of the witnesses who have testified in this case. You must decide which witnesses you believe and how important you think their testimony is. You are not required to accept or reject everything a witness says. You are free to believe all, none, or part of any person's testimony. In deciding which testimony you believe, you should rely on your own common sense and everyday experience. While you must consider all the evidence, you are not required to accept all the evidence as true or accurate. There may be discrepancies or differences within a witness testimony or between the testimony of different witnesses. This does not necessarily mean that a witness Sometimes when two people observe an event, they will see or hear it differently. Sometimes a witness may have an innocent lapse of memory. Witnesses may testify honestly but simply may be wrong about what they thought they saw or remembered. You should consider whether a discrepancy relates to an important fact or only to an unimportant detail. The state has alleged that the respondent violated certain of your statutes and rules. For each of these charges, you must determine whether the alleged violation has been proven by preponderance of the evidence and specify in the findings of fact portion of your order the specific underlying facts that support your decision. In making your determinations, it may be necessary for you to interpret your statutes or rules. When the language of the statute or rule is plain, then you must follow the plain meaning of that language. However, if the language is ambiguous, you may give your interpretation of that language so as to explain the conclusion you reach as to the violation charge. You may only consider the competent evidence presented during this hearing in making your decisions. This does not mean you are required to set aside your common knowledge and training. You may weigh the evidence in light of your training and your own observations and experience. The Administrative Procedures Act specifically requires your order to contain four sections. One, findings of fact. Two, conclusions of law. Three, a decision regarding what action shall be taken, if any. And four, the policy reasons for your decision and determination. 
making findings of fact. You must make your own evaluation of the testimony given by each of the witnesses and any documentary evidence admitted. You must then give the testimony or other evidence the weight and credibility that you deem proper. Once you have made your findings of fact, you must decide if the respondent's activity constitu constitutes a violation of your rules and statutes. Notice of hearing and charges. And if so, you must state those determination in your conclusions of law. Your decision analysis of the evidence to clearly demonstrate how the facts of the case support your conclusions. Your conclusions of law should make appropriate specific references to your findings of fact to articulate linkages and connections between the two sections of your final order. If you decide that there has been a violation of a state statute or rule, you must then decide what action is appropriate in accordance with your legal authority and considering the particular circumstances of this case. Finally, a policy reason must accompany your determination to state why the, deci why the decision you render in this situation is appropriate. Your policy reason tells the public and reviewing courts why your decision in this case is proper. It is simply a short statement as to why the decision you have made is correct. Your deliberations must be in public before all parties. Any action taken by the commission must pass by majority vote of the panel. If you have any questions about the facts presented, you may by majority vote reopen the proof and hear further testimony from witnesses and or argument counsel. Ms. Hayes, do you have proposed findings? Okay. Pass those up to the board. Commission, you can consider these proposed findings and conclusions as you make your determination. Remember, you are not bound by the party's proposed findings and conclusions. Instead, these have only been submitted as a guideline as to what counsel thinks the proof has shown. It is up to you to determine what actually has been proven. I'll turn the hearing over to the commission chairperson to preside over your deliberations. Thank you, Your Honor. Could I ask a question, please? What, to the attorney, what do you... You're going to have to, if you want to, you're basically reopening the case, so you have to take a vote if you want to ask her any questions. Vote among the commission members if you want to ask her something. I was just going to ask a question. I moved that I would be able to ask her a question. All in favor say aye. Aye. I'm sorry, I won't read it. That's fine. What will be the expense, the total expense for the investigation and for the hearing today and any other expense that the state has been out on this case? I can't give you the exact number today. The investigation, I can tell you... Approximate would be okay. At this point, I have to, what I do is I file for a request for those expenses from investigation after the hearing. So at this point, I wouldn't really know a guess as far as the investigation costs go because we had so many times that he went back to revisit and to deliver different documents. So I would be hesitant to guess on that portion of it. I do know from APD we've already incurred for the hearing expenses a $200 filing fee, which is typical when you file amended hearing in charges. And we would also owe for Judge Pogue's time, I believe $100 per hour, which includes the time that he prepared for this case as well as the time he's attended here. The court reporter's time as well would be assessed in that, and I'm not sure the cost of that. If I had to take a ballpark just from my experience from other hearings, it would be in the $2,000 range. Total for all the trips? I believe so. And that's a guess, but it's just an estimate based on experience. Thank you. I have no further questions. In your deliberation. Do we have some discussion? Like the state proved their case. Respondents of the evidence. Do you have anything? 
Um, yeah, I would uh, like to say that under the findings of fact that I think we can agree, uh, at least in my opinion, that uh, Tim Foggio is in fact doing business as Tri-City Sales and Auctions. He was and continues to be unlicensed in the state of Tennessee operating an auction house at 2200 Sullivan Gardens Parkway, Kingsport, Tennessee, 37660. Uh, I think the findings of fact also prove that he is operating um, the, the, the auction barn in the selling of uh, goods by multiple consigners and is charging them a fee or a commission for doing so. Uh, he has widely advertised these auctions and we have evidence in front of us that proves that there are uh, at least probably 67 different occasions where he has held auctions either on a Thursday or a Saturday night each week and uh, that he has been doing that without a licensed auctioneer at least from the period prior to October the 1st, 2015 and after the date of March 30th, 2016, uh, during which time uh, he did have a licensee, Dave Duvall, uh, operating uh, as a licensed auctioneer, we think. Um, know that th the investigator has been out there, he has been to the property and that he has looked at the, the facility and has met with him and has, I think the defendant knows that uh, he is in violation of the law and continues to operate uh, in the face of without having a license and doesn't care to have a license. He is not here today to defend himself or to give explanation as to why he has done that. And so I would say that our findings of fact are as written here has not been able to produce a license, nor do we have any record of any license within the department at any time. And uh, ongoing, they're, they're not, he has not stopped operations and he's continued to be on an operation. I think we need to, uh, and he is in violation of the law which is Tennessee Code 62-19-102, which says it is unlawful for any person to act or advertise or represent to be an auctioneer, apprentice auctioneer or firm without holding a valid license issued by the commission under this chapter of prior state law. That would be the finding that I would read into the record. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Do we have a, <coughs> do we have a motion? Motion we accept the proposed findings of fact. Are, are you, to be clear, wh are you making a motion what he said or what's written down the proposed ones? I was, I was not asking for one that he said. I was asking if anybody had a motion for, as far as the penalty or guilty or not guilty. I'm we'll go find the findings. But you, gotta, you, gotta, you, have to have, you, know, you have to have findings of facts that you vote on. I move before we get to conclusions of law. Can we use this? You can, but you, you need to go through them one by one and make sure that, that you agree with them and, and or, or just so first we have, a, we have a motion what I said. <laughs> we have a motion on the floor to approve what Mr. Morris said. And and I, and that's only to be clear, Mr. Morris, are you reading these item one by one? I w in, in 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 most part I was, yes. But I I think I added a couple of things to that. As opposed as, I think we need to read them one by one, and I can do that if you'd like me to. Mm -hmm. As I said earlier, you you don't you can follow these, you can do your own, um, you can modify these. It's however you all want to do it. I can amend my my motion if it'll Mr. Morris avoid rereading this. Mr. Morris still has the floor. Do we? Oh, he he can go ahead if 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 you'd like for me. I will read the proposed findings of fact. All right, that's fine. All right, so w in addition to what I said, and then we'll start over and say the proposed findings of fact, and I think that they are, and I think the commission agrees that the respondent, Tim Foggio, is in doing business as Tri-City Sales and Auction was and continues to be unlicensed in the state of Tennessee, 
and he operates at 2200 Sullivan Gardens Parkway, Kingsport, Tennessee, 37660. August the 31st, the commission, 2015, the commission received a complaint alleging the respondent was operating without a license and did not maintain an escrow account. Number three, the respondent advertised auction dates on September the 3rd, 2015, September the 5th, 2015, September the 12th, 2015 on auctionzip.com. And the respondent lists auction dates under auction zip auction I, auctioneer ID 41845. I think we saw evidence of that. Number four, the respondent also advertises auction dates on a business Facebook page under the name Tri-Cities Auctions and Sales. Number five, he on October the, September the 5th, 2015, the state conducted an investigation of the respondent. The investigator went to the King, respondent's Kingsport, Tennessee location and observed a sign that said auction. No license was displayed at the location. Number six, the investor inv requested a license from the respondent, but the respondent could not produce one. Number seven, from October the 1st, 2015 to March 30th, 2016, the licensee, Dave Duvall, took over the respondent's location. However, the licensee withdrew from the auction based on management disagreements with respondent Tim Baggio. Number eight, excluding the dates in which a licensee operated the respondent's auction, the respondent has held a total of over 67 auctions without first obtaining a firm license. And number nine, since the notice of hearing and charges were filed, the respondent continues to operate without a firm license. And number 10, the respondent intentional ongoing violations of the license requirements were created a risk to the public because the respondent continues to operate without an escrow account or any other form of oversight intended to prevent harm to consumers. Those findings of fact. <coughs> Motion we approve or accept the proposed and read findings of fact. We've heard the finding of the facts and have a motion to approve. All in favor, aye. Second. I'm sorry. Got a second. Ask for any discussion. Any discussion? Hearing none, let's have a roll call. Thank you. Mr. Jeff Collier. Jeff Morris. I'm sorry. Ron Collier. Here. Thank you. Bobby Colson. Here. Jeff Morris. Here. Howard Phillips. Yes. Adam Lewis. Yes. All in favor. <coughs> Chairman, I would move also that we have if some conclusions based on the facts that we have found and that uh, I, I think that we can say that we can conclude that he has committed a violation of Tennessee Code 62-19-102, which says it's unlawful for any person to act or advertise or represent to be an auctioneer, apprentice, auctioneer, firm without holding a valid license issued by the commission under the chapter or under prior state law and that uh, he is in violation, in my opinion, and I move that we uh, conclude that. Second. And moved and second that we approve him being in violation of Tennessee auction law. Is this where the uh, penalty will be next? That'll be next. We're just concluding that he is in violation of the law. I have another roll call, please. Conclusion of facts. Uh, Ron Collier. Yes. Bobby Colson. Yes. Jeff Morris. Yes. Howard Phillips. Yes. Adam Lewis. Yes. Thank you. Our next step, Mr. Chairman, is to decide what penalty uh, we should uh, induce upon this. Uh, and based on the flagrantness uh, of the violation and the fact that he has not attended or offered any defense, I move that we 
give it the maximum penalty under the allowable under the law, which would be $1,000 per occurrence, which would be times 67 time occurrences, and to include all costs of the hearing and investigation to be assessed to the defendant as well on top of that. Second. It's been moved and second that a penalty be assessed of $67,000 plus all expenses. Is that correct? Yes, Roll call, please. Is there any discussion? That's what I was trying to think. I w I'd like to ask what if when we vote on this, then if if he auctions and don't pay what we fixing to put on him, then what happens? That's that's what I'd like to ask if I'm able to do that, John. Well, that that <coughs> that's for another day, actually. I, I think that what they will do, they will assess the penalty. You'll get notice of that, uh, and then the state has various uh, legal courses that they can take to uh, place liens on the property or on his accounts or on him, and, and they'll pursue that. Uh, if there's no more discussion, we'll have a roll call vote. Ron Collier? Yes. Bobby Colson? Yes. Jeff Morris? Yes. Howard Phillips? Yes. Adam Lewis? Yes. All in agreement. All in agreement. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I would say that we are under the policy reason for making the conclusions of law and the decisions that we did that it is the policy of this commission to protect the public utilizing the laws of the state of Tennessee and the adopted rules that we have to the best of our ability to protect the public of the citizens of the state of Tennessee. Is that a motion? We got a vote on that. Was that a motion? That was a motion. A second. Read the motion, please. It, the po it is the policy of this commission to protect the public utilizing the laws of the state of Tennessee and the adopted rules of this commission to the best of our ability to protect the citizens of the state of Tennessee. Thank you. All in, it's been, motion's been made and second. All in the favor, roll call. Ron Collier? Yes. Bobby Colson? Yes. Jeff Morris? Yes. Howard Phillips? Yes. Adam Lewis? Yes. All in agreement. Thank you, member of your, the commission, for your time. That concludes the hearing. Thank you, sir. Thank you, members of the commission. I appreciate your time and letting me appear before you today. Very nice job. Good job. I'd like to take a 10-minute break, please. Back on my impression of my call. Yeah, I think that's about it. Where did we get to, Roxanne? Right we are on page 144 and the start of our legal report, so we'll turn it over to Sarah. We don't have any application or anything? I don't think so. Okay. There's no application. Yeah. Okay. What page is that on there? 144. Ready there? Very bottom. Yeah. Tap on the bottom. Is Tap it just so to get you. Oh, on 44, oh, you baby. Okay, I will read the case numbers and then we can have discussion, questions. No reading this time. <laughs> That's for you, Bobby. <laughs> Number one, 2016043221 and 2016043222.
me when you're ready for the recommendation and then I'll read that to you. Breaking the law and we're going to uh, fine him for like a thousand bucks and give him the option, you know, if you come and do this or do that, you know, you only give us $250. Breaking the law, you're breaking the law, you know. I, I did this, um, we do it in some of the other programs and we've had a lot of success with people actually coming in and getting licensed. So I just threw that out there, you don't have to do it. We can do the thousand and just leave it at that or. Person's guilty, you know, we're going to, we can find them, I mean, and, and get them to do what they need to do. I'm, I'm not for giving up part of it, you know, if you come and do this or do that, you know, if you're guilty, you're guilty. I'm, that's just my. I, I, agree, I agree with Ronnie. I, I read that, and uh, I mean, I don't think we're in the business of selling license, and that sounds like what we're that would be doing if, if they if the fine needs to be a thousand dollars or two thousand. That's what it needs to be, and then that should wake them up and let them come and get their license or get out of business. <coughs> that is perfect. I will use that on the go forward. So for this one, respondent one, I made the recommendation of a thousand, drop it to two fifty if they applied for their licensure. And we will change that to a thousand if one of you all wants to. I move that we uh, find respondent one a thousand dollars for unlicensed activity. Second. <laughs> okay, I was waiting on you to go on. Is that is that all you're saying? You want to yeah. do respondent one and two together? Uh, well, I guess I can, and and I will add in my. Second. Motion's been made and second to find the number one thousand dollars and dismiss number two. Okay, number two is two zero one six zero five five seven eight one. Oh, yeah, I guess we did. Okay. I didn't hear a vote. Sorry. We didn't, we didn't vote. I'm getting ahead of myself. No, they do everyone. Did we do them all? Well, I guess we need to go by one by one. All in favor say aye. 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 Ayes have it. 2016055781. Read these and stay more in order. You want to read it for us? Are you reading it? Oh. It has his name on it. A motion to uh, go with a penalty of one thousand dollars and and not give them an option to come in and get a license to pay the two fifty. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and second for a thousand dollar penalty. All in favor? Aye. 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 Next.
So in your investigation of this complaint, could you, is it, I mean, they said they had over 4,500 approved bidders, and this one guy didn't get his stuff in on the right, at, at the right time. Were you able to substanti substantiate what the respondent said? Um, I just was able to talk to the respondent, and this is what he confirmed over. Did he offer any proof as to that? Um, he didn't. I could go back and ask if he has that record that he could send us to see if he has like a list of bidders and if this person was actually registered. Well, this was a, a live, live and online. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Simultaneous. Yeah. So, did the complainant uh, confirm that that they did not submit their information on time or provide the credit card information? Or did you ever talk to the complainant about so, that? So, um, the complainant, what it appeared is that they thought that they were registered and bidding. But were, they, were, were they bidding online? They were bidding online, yeah. If they were, if they weren't approved as a bidder, how would they be able to bid online? That is what I was confused at in this matter. So you haven't talked to the complainant? No, the complainant, we did not talk. I would venture to say that you'd have to have some proof that the complainant did not register by the deadline. Number one, it, it, number one, it, it, is there such a rule? Is it published? Did they publish that rule? And number two, did they in fact not get approved in time? And number three, did they not provide, the, is, is the credit card, like on my system, if you don't put the credit card information, you're automatically kicked out anyway. So I don't know how their system works. So I think there needs to be a little bit more information there before I can make a decision for, my, for myself as to this case. Well, if the person didn't get registered, I understand. That's maybe for you. But I wouldn't mind having some, some proof that I'm kind of like Jeff. I hate to agree with Jeff, but, you know. Well, <laughs> the complainant submitted his absentee bid after 12 noon deadline of Friday, July the 29th. It was submitted email at 9.28 on 29th. Uh, he wasn't bidding online if he sent in an absentee bid. Yeah. Well, I, I can ask form. for a copy That's of that a good email. Point too. That don't sound right either, does it? No, there's something, there's, there's some couple worms things in this. just don't sound right. Uh, I can ask for a copy of that email. I think he needs a little bit more information on this one. I move that we postpone this one until um, additional information can be ascertained as to this case. Second. We move and second that we postpone this one until we receive more information. All in favor, aye. 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 Okay, we number should talk to the complainant, too. Yeah, we'll reach out to both parties and see what we can get from them. Number four is 201605 I've read it. 
you wait. Oh, hey, well, this one's deep right here. I'm used to somebody reading it kind of like a bedtime story. I'm not used to having to read it. <laughs> what happened to that Roxanne where somebody read these complaints to us? When? She spoiled us. <laughs> That's okay. I've read it. And, and the hope is if we also email it to you that you've had a chance because sometimes it's just a lot to read by the time you go through. So, Like homework. Yeah. Like yeah. homework. Sorry, yeah. homework. I got home too late to do my homework. <laughs> and although I was responsible with both, I still did. Okay, council recommends a dismissal because this was an online auction. Now, okay. now, let Miss Council, let's go back t to the auction laws. These people solicited an auction. They went out to their house and took pictures. And we're going to auction this stuff off for them. Okay? So therefore, they broke the law. Well, because they're they are they fall under the exemption for time listing. You can't fall under the exemption for soliciting auctions without a license. There is no exemption to that. And and it, this is a licensed entity. I mean, they're licensed. I mean, if you're so licensed, it don't look like me. It don't make no difference. Even if that, I mean, the, the online portion of this auction was exempt, but they are a licensed firm, so. Online auctions cannot be exempt from a person with an auctioneer license. That's an online auction. I've been, I've got three ending this week. They can continue. The only difference is they can, mine can continue, okay? These people did an auction. They listed merchandise, but you say now you say they've got an auction. They do have a light. It says it at the, the beginning. Well, why do you say that council well, recommends this be dismissed due to online auction and that's exemption? Probably, that's probably my fault. I think this should have said council recommends this be dismissed due to no violations. I think I meant to put the exemption up above where I said this was an online estate sale. I think you caught me in my my error. I'm sorry about catching you making an <laughs> error. but Yes, this one I didn't see any violations in. It just looked like somebody that was upset because they didn't get enough money for their items. Well, what, how, how do you donate people's items when they tell you you don't? That, that was an issue for me, but that was a lot of he said, she said, and there was no way I could prove that they donated them or they didn't donate them. One person was telling me we didn't, the other person said they did, and nobody could provide any proof. So you've talked to both parties in this? Did they say that they, how long was it, it was the auction went, was a month before they did, four months before they did it or something? That I'm un unsure of. Well, I thought I read that, I'm sorry. Did you? Uh, uh, it was changed four times for the auction. I know, I know you're not an auctioneer, and I know that you've never put up with the headaches that auctioneers do when they go out to somebody's house and pick up merchandise. But number one, these people were wrong because they did not make a list of the items they were picking up. Okay, number two, they were wrong when they didn't put a date down the, the date they were going to sell this stuff. Um, I think they bear a little responsibility here. I don't know what, but I figure out what the uh, what what the real issue is here. The fact they moved the date—I mean, there's nothing you can do about that. There's no law that says you have to. Well, I mean, that's just business. She said she thought items mentioned. Yeah, well, and they, and they said, did they not tell you they donated some items? That was an allegation, I believe, from the complainant. Items donated on Brian's consent, but what, but what were they? Well, apparently the stuff 
It says that I, <clears throat> there was a rake that sold for $23, but you said nobody had picked it up. There was a stuff at the house, and they sold it at the house. It appears they had it at a warehouse. Um, and so that's what it says down here at the bottom where respondent responded to me and said there was a rake, and they sold it for $23, and no one had picked it up yet. But it was sold. But it was sold. Did the, uh, did the seller, are they saying they didn't get paid for the rake? This one said, uh, said when he asked someone about it, they told him that it had someone had purchased it and not paid for it. So I think that the complainant thought that it wasn't paid for, but they were just waiting for someone to come pick it up and pay, I assume. Well, you don't know how long from the time they sold the merchandise. But you're saying this is an online auction, okay? This is all online, yeah. Second. There's been a move, motion made to dismiss and a second. I would like to change. The is there any discussion? Yes, I would like to change the reason to no violations. No violations. Rather than online auction. We do. I, I, I amend my motion to read that I move that we dismiss due to no violations. We do a roll call on this one, please. Ron Collier? Yes. Bobby Colson? Jeff Morris? Yes. Howard Phillips? No. Adam Lewis? Yes. We have four yeses and one no. Thank you. Okay, number five, two zero one six zero five zero five seven five five one. I think the uh, defense of I didn't know is not substantial enough to get him out of this one. Pose a civil penalty of $1,000 against respondent number one for the No, I'm not for reading it. Okay. I got, I got screwed up. I'd like to say it would it take the option of the two hundred. I didn't. I didn't include that. So I mean, that's not. It's just a thousand dollar penalty. Yeah. I go and read the rest of that. Sure I yeah, yeah. It's just a thousand dollar deal. No big deal. I just want to be sure. Yeah. I, I, I okay. We have a, a motion to assess a penalty of one thousand dollars in a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, last one, number six, two zero one six zero six one six nine one.
I'd like to ask a question about this. Did they advertise on this as a no reserve auction? Uh, yes. Yes. Auctioneer have a real estate license? The auctioneer, uh, let me think. I do not know if the auctioneer in this case did. That's, that's what these companies are doing. They're coming in and they're holding themselves out as, as uh, they, they, they find somebody with an auction license, then they find somebody with a real estate license, then they come into the state and they have these non-absolute, absolute sales. And this is what gets everybody confused and messed up and is, and is, is causing a real ripple in the, in the auction community. And I think we need to do whatever we can to, to clamp down on this as, as hard as we can possibly do it, uh, it in my opinion. You know, they, they, they play games with this uh, reserve, uh, being no reserve, but if you don't give us a, a substantial opening bid that's acceptable by the seller, then we don't open the auction and da 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 da, da. And it's not an absolute auction. And it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it's an absolute violation. You, you know, it, it's, it's uh, misrepresenting the facts, and it's playing games with what an absolute auction is. They're using it as an open house, it, like, or something. Exactly. And it's, 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 it's a, it's a rip-off. It's a rip-off not only to the buyer, but to the sellers, too. No question. I mean, the seller's front, no telling how much money for all these. And they do it on, on multi-million-dollar estates where they have these safety nets, quote-unquote, for the seller, so that, you know, we say, well, it's an absolute auction. We're going to have to do the absolute auction, but we have the safety net of, the fact that if we don't get a high, high enough opening bid to even start the auction, we don't open it up. And you sh I just don't think you sh can do that. And where's the safety net to the, for all that money that the seller paid them up front to pay for all this advertising stuff right. they do? Right. Well, another problem with it is that you go into your hometown and list the house that's going to sell for one point sells for $1.7 million, you made $170,000, we find you $1,000. I don't see anything pretty about that picture. We need to change, we need to change our ways so they'll quit it. And it's happening every week in the state of Tennessee. I don't know, I don't know if we can, if, if there's a, a way that we can hold the auctioneer who holds the auction? I mean, the only license that we have any purview over is a an auction license. If we can't hold them in contempt and and have violate their license. Well, and I mean, for this one, you did bring up a good point. We can open up another complaint against this auctioneer personally to see if he has a real estate license in Tennessee. Wouldn't be a bad idea too to maybe refer this to the uh, real estate commission. Real estate board. Yeah. But that's that, but that's what they're doing. I mean, and um, excuse me. Go ahead. How many violations did he commit? I mean, this one, as I mean, this one was kind of complicated because they're unlicensed. So there's really one thing that we can get them for, is unlicensed activity, and we can give them a thousand dollar civil penalty. But is is there an auctioneer involved in this case? There is an auctioneer involved in this. I case. would open the case against that auctioneer. Okay. He's supposed to know that. That's that's the this thousand dollar penalty is is okay, but if you don't get to the person conducting the sale, we haven't accomplished anything. So I can we can absolutely I'll, open I, I want to put auctioneers on notice that when you get a call from one of these out of town out of state companies that say, hey, I want to use your auctioneer license Buddy, you better be lined up. It better be advertised in your name, and you and better they, have, they a, real pay, and you better have a, a real estate license. And, and they probably just paid him a flat fee, so exactly right. uh, 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 something's going to get his attention uh, or hers. But, uh, you know, really on a deal like this, whoever that auctioneer was should have been the one to handle the earnest money and the whole bit. That earnest money should have stayed in the state. He was uh, supposed to. That, that's the reason I was asking how many violations he committed. Because he's supposed to have, this auctioneer is supposed to have an escrow account. He's supposed to deposit this earnest money into the escrow account, and the auctioneer or the real estate broker, which he should be, like Jeff is, he should distribute the money at closing. 
Uh, also, that, that whole sale should be advertised under his company's name. Yeah, because if you count all these violations up that the auctioneer did, there's several. Uh, can we postpone this until you discover a little bit more about this case? Um, on this one, do you actually want to postpone this one, or do you want to vote on this one against the company and then open another complaint against the company? We can do it. All right, make the motion that we issue the maximum civil penalty under the law of $1,000 that we're allowed to do against the company and that we open the case against the uh, auctioneer. Uh, I thought you could do 2500 uh, Whatever that is. Did, you, with, did the sale go through? Do you know if they sold it or anything? They did? You know what it sold for? Yeah, it's, it's one of these deals. It's concierge or one of them that, you know, I, I promise you, or Grand Estates, which is out of business. But. Also doing business to them. Well, like I said, you know. Second right now. We get a second? Okay. Yeah. All right. We have a motion to give the maximum penalty to the company. Okay, we'll do that. And to open up a case. And you can put that in this motion. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And open up a case against the auctioneer. All in favor? Aye. 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 Moving on to that next legal report. Um. The next legal report, I will explain this to you. We are going through a restructure in legal. I will still be your attorney for the day-to-day -to, -day to help Roxana. I will do all the rulemaking, all the legislation for you all, but we will have what they call disciplinary <coughs> counsel. Um, the auctioneer's disciplinary counsel will be Robin Ryan and Dennis Gregory. They will prepare the legal report. Um, they've decided to do it this way so that the attorneys have it from start to litigation if it goes there because right now I do it at the beginning and then I hand it over to them and they have to kind of learn it from scratch this way they will have it from start to finish but I will be at every meeting assisting with everything on your your questions and anything you have oh you can ask Robin if she would like to read to you I'm <laughs> I could be ready <coughs> we've had Robin before right Did oh she yeah. do the last formal hearing yeah that's yeah. Howard's favorite attorney but um, so that will be happening. Oh, also, necessary. <laughs> <laughs> also, at the next meeting, I will be bringing you some stuff to look at for um, donuts. I can bring you donuts in the next meeting for citations. Um, I think that you all have discussed this in the past, maybe with Keeling. Um, the department is trying to do citations for unlicensed activity. So that would be a situation where we have someone that comes in, we investigate it, we find out they're unlicensed, and we go ahead and just give them a civil penalty essentially we send them a citation it doesn't have to come before you um, we could do that in a couple different ways we could say time number one is a thousand dollars time number two is I don't, like that. I don't like that I think the board needs to hear all the complaints for unlicensed activity do you do you vary greatly in the decisions if I could ask that because no we varied on this one sixty seven thousand dollars that would be our biggest issue is that most of our unlicensed well, activity yeah, are not just one it's multiple auctions I y'all like it the way it is we I will report I like back things, I like things the way they are you don't like to change very often no, do you not much and, and to add I've that got the same wife for 57 <laughs> years <laughs> sure she's happy to hear that if I could add what's happening with complaints is um, a lot of the changes we're going through is centralizing certain things to, to get a cost benefit to each commission and to, you know, all the regulatory boards. So part of that is we're centralizing complaints. Um, they're still checking with us for everything that's unusual, anything that doesn't fit that norm. That centralized division is checking with the offices to see this is different, how do you want to handle it. That um, processing the statute that would allow these agreed citations, if you will, for this particular unlicensed activity allows the some of them to move faster if they're the standard so you could put in the decision if, if the Commission chose 
to do the unlicensed activity only when it meets certain criteria. So you could limit it, and those would move much faster. The office would get them done. The individual would, would get something similar to, I compare it to like a, a speeding ticket. If you know you got it, you know you were at fault, you could take care of it quickly. If not, you can still not sign it, not agree, and it would follow. But you can limit which ones are presented. Well, it goes back to selling this house for $2 million at 10% buyer's premium. You make $200,000 and we're going to automatically send them a fine out of $1,000. We need to work on this. And I think if you quit bringing it before the commission, it'll be like everything else. It'll just kind of fly away and nobody knows what's going on. And if we're going to drive from Memphis and Knoxville down here, we, we have time to hear them. Okay, I'll report that back. We don't have that many words, so we're, yeah. it's about 30 or 40, you know, it's six. Yeah. You mean you're not like my real estate commission with 100? <laughs> not, and I have one question about a meeting that I wasn't at last time. Yes, sir. There was a complaint about an ad on a radio, on TV advertising an auction. Remember that mm -hmm. one? I do. Okay, that was dismissed, and I've got no problem with it. I was not here. I couldn't vote, so that's fine. But I sit in front of that TV and watch them advertise that auction on TV with no license. Was no. that one dismissed? Yes. So, I mean, I mean, if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I might think, well, there might have been something going on, but this, it was that sports station, remember? <clears throat> I wasn't here, so I wanted to know. Well, there is, there is a problem because everything's so anonymous. Um, that one was actually put everything into in a, the letter of, a letter of warning. We sent them a letter of warning telling them that they needed to, uh, under the unlicensed, essentially telling them unlicensed activity and the rule which explained advertising. So we did send them a letter of warning. It's in the minutes. Because I went back and watched that multiple segments of that sports show. Oh, I mean, I watch <laughs> it every week. I mean, <laughs> if you like Tennessee football. <laughs> it's called basketball now. Anyway, that's all I have to say to you. Okay. Have you got I don't think I have anything. Um, do you all have any other questions on the rules? I know Frankie came down, and just so you know, like Frankie's rule, is, his role in this is only to convey to the legislators what our rule says. That is his job, um, and he's guided by Assistant Commissioner Brian McCormack. And oh, we're, so ta we're, we're talking about the online auction, yes, right? Yes. That so Frankie's job is just to explain kind of, we tell him what that rule means and he explains it to the legislators so that they understand. Um, I think that there was some confusion at the last rulemaking hearing on what the rule actually there said. There was a lot of confusion because it wasn't explained real well. Yes, and we're hoping that at this next one, um, but we can explain One thing that I would ask if you have time, which I know you're so busy, but if you would go and look up complaints on online auctions, and you'll see, they asked you that question, you know, remember how many complaints does the auctioneer commission get? Well, we're not going to get complaints on online auctions when they're not licensed. They're going to go to the dog found somebody to complain, not the auctioneer commission, because they don't have anything to do with it. But if you look at the FBI, how many investigations they're doing across the United States for fraudulent online auctions, it's unreal. And okay. another thing I'd like for you to do, if you would go back to 2006 when this eBay law came into effect, and you digest that real good, that was intended and is intended for people like her gets goes rents her a store <clears throat> and you take consignments to that store and she sells it online for you. That was the intent of this. It was never intended for 
everybody to be doing online auctions. It was only on, under eBay, and now it's like a can of worms. What's the, what's the next step in the decision process? I guess the timeline. They're meeting again when? The 14th, yeah. Meet again on the 14th. Um, when they said the 14th, I looked at the agenda. We are tentatively scheduled for the first thing on the 15th because I know they have a pretty busy schedule on the 14th, and they're saying if they can't get us in. It's I the mean, 15th on Thursday? Yes. Okay, well, that's great because I couldn't come on Wednesday. I don't think I'll be able to come. I might not be able to come. we got our car sale on Thursday. Car sale, you know, I can't postpone we'll keep you. Time. We'll kind of keep you updated when we hear more of what's going on consent calendar versus what's staying on the agenda. <laughs> is, it, is there it, – it, but the next step to the process is like Frankie said, they're either going to accept it and push it through or they're going to reject it. Um, what does that mean? Mark and Michael are looking into now if they can essentially line item reject. And so that would mean they could pass everything else in our rule because it is all of our military applicant stuff. It's got good stuff in it, but they could technically take out any part that they didn't want to pass. If they reject it, like Frankie said, it will go into effect as of 1216, and then it will not be effective as of June 30th because it won't get picked up on the bill. When you say if they reject it, yep, you are talking about rejecting the online auction as we have it. As we have written it in the rule. Okay. In the rule. Rejecting the rule. Okay. Everything that we have. Uh, and that rule, is, that rule that, that you're talking about rejecting is the one is the opinion of the attorney general. That an one online that auction does not meet the criteria of an auction because it has a beginning and ending time. It would reject the definition of what a timed listing is not, I believe is what it says. That's what they would reject, the proposed. When you say reject, do you mean they would keep that like it is? They would go back to what we have currently. We just wouldn't have a rule on it. So like right now we don't have a rule on it, we just have the exception. So that, so this company from North Dakota wouldn't be able to get what they're trying to do right now. Is that right? What is the company from North North Dakota trying to do? Just they're trying to get that extended where they can be doing an online auction. And extend and, and time. It, and as long as people are bidding, they can keep extending it. The thing right now is your statute says that they are exempt except if it is a simulcast of a live auction you have the authority to interpret that statute to mean an extension of time is a simulcast of a live auction, which is what you've done in the past. So if this rule does not go into effect, you can still have a complaint against those businesses for a simulcast of a live auction. So what does this rule, how does it tighten it up? This rule, <laughs> I mean. Really tighten it up or not? I, in my opinion, no. it's kind of just an interpretation of how the commissions looked at that statute in the past. I don't think it it doesn't put any additional teeth into that statute to where. It doesn't really matter if they pass or reject it. We're still. We able still to have do the, the authority to interpret the statute the way you've been interpreting it. I wish there were a way but that anybody who takes a consigned item and offers it for any kind of system that allows for the discovery of the highest price by bidding in increments up until you get the highest price would constitute an auction and would be under the purview of this commission. Uh, well, I, I, I could whether it extends or doesn't extend or whatever. I mean, if, you know, if on eBay, if I go to eBay right now, 90% of the stuff says buy it now at this price. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's what people do. They don't, they, they really quit being in the online auction business and they're more of a store where you, if you want to buy it at this price, you can. Right. If you want to offer less, you can wait and bid on it or whatever. And most of the sellers on there's people that have done 10,000 transactions. It's not. Right, exactly. It's it's not, yeah, so yeah. my point is, I think there's, if you take eBay out of it and their orders are not down here fighting it, then there there may be an opportunity for us to 
garner more control over these online auctions especially as it relates to the state type items and estate type sales where they're having basically an online sale through increased offers or bids as we like to call them in the industry you know and that would be a, a, a way for us to have those people license we, we talked about it last night in the, at the Tennessee Auctioneer Association you know meeting there's a whole lot of t what we call tag sale or state sale people who are not conducting a normal sale and they're doing it online only and there's yet zero accountability on behalf of the public uh, from a fiduciary responsibility that these uh, operators have to their clients to obtain them the best possible price for their goods and uh, they're limited by what their opinion is of that item by offering it for sale uh, versus the true, true price discovery through the capital markets of saying give us your highest and best price and have allowing the general public to bid on them and you know it just I think we've got to look at that and figure out a way that we can either have them license or have them life and I don't and the question was well under license under what board you know it would be, be through the commerce and insurance department and it would be through a board like the auctioneers or if they could be under the au auctioneer because it, it is an auction and and so uh, I don't know how we get that uh, that control over it or get that get that done but I don't think you would have the pushback from major online sales companies like Google, uh, like eBay, like Amazon, uh, who offer their goods, you know, basically online uh, and have a price on them. Well, something has to be done. I'll give you another example, and then we'll take another five minutes on this subject. There was a bulldozer advertised in East Tennessee on an online auction. A guy purchased it for $17,000. His credit card went through. He goes to get the dozer, and there is no dozer, and never has been a dozer. And he waited. He called the people and told them that he had to make arrangements to get a truck, and it would be, you know, a couple of weeks or something. And when he got, they were gone. There was never a dozer, so he lost $17,000. That's one instance. It'll happen 25 times today. There is, and, and the people in this business building don't realize what's going out on in this real world out here. It's, it's not the most honest people that, if they were honest, they'd come and get them, they'd go to school for two weeks and get their auctioneer license as easy as it is to do. Based on what you're saying, Howard, somebody from Bangladesh could do that, collect the money, and, yeah, and, yeah, and, you, yeah. and you're not, you're not, uh, protected at all and we have no laws that would govern that we got one more thing and then I'm done I know I have been since 2006 or 7 or whenever it was that the Attorney General made the opinion that an online auction didn't fit the auction I don't understand how that ever a person could imagine that you're doing an online auction and accepting bids and it's not an auction. And that's the part that needs to be changed. There's a different attorney general now, I believe, that might look at it different. Anybody else have any discussion? She wanted to go. I believe the attorney general or a representative from his office will be at the next meeting or it will make a statement that will be where he will meet with Representative Bell on his own. I think it's going to be on the, on the 15th rather than the 14th. It it all, you're going to represent us, right? Yep, I'll, I'll go back up there. I'll read the... Oh, you'll read to them. <laughs> they're, they're scarier. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll essentially read them the same thing I did, and then I assume they have more questions. Um, we have pulled the numbers for them. I believe when Michael and I looked at them, there were... 258 complaints filed with the commission since 2011. Approximately 27 of those are on online auctions. And I want to say there was like six or seven that were on this specific topic of extending time. So we have those numbers pulled together for the committee. 
We need to get those off the internet because that 27 compliance or whatever it is, is I mean, that's that's a drop in the bucket to the complaints that are out there. They're just, uh, they just don't know where to complain. What it sounded like to me, too, they were, were concerned about it being a turf war, you know, auctioneers turning in auctioneers and stuff like that. But, you know, it's kind of like we've been talking about a lot of times on this, on this deal here, the general public don't know where to call. And uh, sometimes if an auctioneer, if we don't police ourselves a little bit, uh, nothing's ever going to get done. So that's not necessarily a bad thing, it's some of that. No, absolutely you know. not. But And your numbers did show that you have a majority of your complaints come from the general public and not from competitors. So that is. That's good. Who's, who's the representative? You said Bell? Mm -hmm. He's the, he's the, Mike Bell, the chairman. Yeah. He's the Mike chairman. Bell mm -hmm. from Riceville, Tennessee? Yep. Mm -hmm. He's my, he's my senator and a friend, and I'm willing to call him. Yeah, he's the but chair. But I need to know exactly what we're asking and whether or not it's worth asking. Well, we've already talked to him. I mean, we've been down there. Wouldn't hurt. Uh, well, well, nothing will hurt. Ex but, but one more thing. The, they said, was this hurting the little guy? The question was, is this hurting the little guy? That's li we are the little guys. The big guys are that company out of North Dakota and eBay and Amazon, they they've got they've got the money. We're we're the ones that need some protection on this. That is, and if I could, good. the question was also about the public. You know, is the this is this out there protect to protect the public? That's who I'm talking about. Yes. You know, us. And we are the public in this situation. And that's the key. I think there was a lot of confusion that day. I there mean were, there back was. and forth. You've got to remember that when we're talking about these proposed rules, if you will, these rules that they're reading, it's real important to say the rules as we're proposing versus leaving it alone and what's in place right now. That, that kept going back to sounding like what's in place now is perfect and no one was really um, pushing and talking about the, the, the way they were being written to, to move forward. Right, that's where the confusion came in, yes. I think. That they yes, because I listened mind. to it from a, diff, you know, from a brand new perspective and, and lost me almost immediately right, just they, as well. They, they couldn't make up their mind whether us or Representative Gravit or whoever, which side we were on, you know. Yeah, because for a while it sounded like we were on opposing sides when we were on the same side. So how, do we, how do we need to word that when we uh, talk to them? I know that Frankie and Michael and I believe Brian have spoke with Representative Gravit since then to make sure he is on the same page as we are and I think they've told him. You remember I went up and talked to him when he was sitting there. Yeah and, and they talked to him after and I think they've conveyed to him that it was very confusing the way that he stated the rules as is and I'm kept stating confused. that instead of saying the proposed rules that we have proposed. Um, but I know that they've met with him. wanted to leave the amendment as is, the yes. rule as it was, not change the rule. Yeah. And I think they thought he didn't want to change the law. He, what he didn't want to change was the rule. Yeah. And it, they, it was confusing. They've met with him and discussed. They've met with Bell since then and discussed. And we have very open communication with Bell on discussions. And we sent him the numbers so he does have those. And I will look up the FBI stuff just to see where their numbers are. And just so we have that in our pocket so, we need so it. you feel you feel okay that we're going to be able to leave our rule I, we're going to I will tell you I think it could it could go either way um, I think we do have some support now that it's been explained to the people that it needed to be explained to um, but honestly I I haven't met with them personally since so but just from talking to Frankie, I think that they're pretty positive on just pushing forward. Move to adjourn. Well, we're not through yet. Oh. I withdraw my move to adjourn. <coughs> Do you have anything else, Alice? We're adjourned. Perfect.